Hi, from Heirloom Books at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Jeff Helgeson, and today I'm talking about two highly influential books, Utopia by Sir Thomas More, St. Thomas More, in fact, since 1935, and The Prince by Niccolò Machiavelli, who, to my knowledge, has yet to be considered for canonization. Utopia, or rather, on the best state of a republic and on the new island of Utopia, was first published in Latin in present-day Belgium in 1516, while three years earlier a manuscript of Machiavelli's work had already begun to be circulated, although it was not published until 1532, five years following its author's death and three years before Thomas More was beheaded at the command of his English Renaissance prince, Henry VIII. What these two books, Utopia and The Prince, seem to have in common, at least to me anyway, is that they each attempt to chart out, admittedly, very different courses to what is essentially the same destination with respect to suppression of individualism through systematic forms of authoritarian rule. According to futurist and historian H.G. Wells, the author of The War of the Worlds, The Time Machine, and The Outline of History, in a 1935, the year of Moore's canonization, as a Catholic martyr, Heritage Press Introduction to Utopia, it was because of the writing of this book as the first man of affairs in England to imitate the Republic of Plato, that Sir Thomas of More, a man for all seasons, is known about at all. Paradoxically, uh, Wells goes on to assert, never were the forms of socialism and communism animated by so entirely individualist a soul. Similarly, as described by Max Lerner in an introduction to a 1940 modern library translation of The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli, um, he is described as one of those rare intellectuals who write about politics because they have had a hand in politics and know what it is about. What Moore and Machiavelli have in common is that they each had the chance to view political power at the highest levels in their respective societies from the vantage point of direct involvement. One as the Lord Chancellor of England, and the other as a bureaucrat and diplomat for the city-state of Florence, who had the occasion to observe and assess at first hand the use of power by practitioners the like of Caesar Borgia, the illegitimate son of Pope Alexander VI and brother of the alleged poisoner Lucretia, among others. Of course, there are distinct differences between these two close-up witnesses to politics and practice. For Machiavelli, it was largely secular concerns that caused him to be arrested, tortured, and exiled from the city of Florence by the Medici family. With Thomas More, by contrast, it was strict adherence to fundamental Catholic doctrine, which in 1535 led to his beheading for unspoken but assumed to be guilty opposition to King Henry VIII's inclinations to uh, set aside his wife and deceased elder brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon, in order to marry Anne Boleyn, Catherine's lady-in-waiting, who later became the mother of Queen Elizabeth I, and who Henry also had beheaded. Machiavelli wrote The Prince, in addition to a number of plays and The Art of War, 
while living in disgrace of political fortune on a farm outside Florence until his death in 1527, still hoping for a return to a position of power. It had been 12 years earlier, in 1515, when Thomas More, not yet either knighted or beatified, had been sent as an ambassador from the English court to the Netherlands, and it was the occasion of this mission that became the catalyst for writing Utopia. While in the Low Countries, More had become acquainted with a man in Antwerp named Peter Giles, and it was allegedly through this acquaintance that he was then introduced to a global traveler who, a decade before, was supposed to have accompanied Americo Vespucci on a journey to the New World just a few years after its discovery during the first voyages of Christopher Columbus. It was this traveler from an antique land who was then supposed to have provided more with information regarding the social and cultural practices described in Utopia, a term derived from Greek meaning no place, which became a somewhat significant point of contention for Machiavelli. The way Moore relates the ideas contained in his narrative, nonetheless, is to first establish a sense of reality by associating the fictitious traveler's tale with an actual diplomatic trip and a real person in Peter Giles, a letter to whom is included by Moore at the beginning of the book. The apparent circumstance, therefore, is one of a casual encounter with an intriguing, mysterious stranger who can both comment upon European social conditions and offer information regarding how things are done differently, presumably better, in a distant land, hopefully without placing more the mere narrator of things reported to him at risk of potential reprisal. That's the setup. What Richard Nixon's spin doctors would have termed plausible deniability just repeating something that somebody else had said. Of course, as a further shield against potential accusations of incitement to possible insurrection, Utopia was also written in Latin rather than the vernacular English of Geoffrey Chaucer and only published outside of England as edited by humanist priest Erasmus of Rotterdam until as many as 16 years after Sir Thomas More's execution, declaring himself the king's good servant, but God's first. Anyway, an ambassador meets a traveler named Raphael Heathleday, whose name, first name, is an apparent biblical reference to an archangel who is supposed to have once restored the sight of a blind man, and probably not the Italian Renaissance painter or the presently far more famous mutant ninja turtle of the same name. And they, the diplomat and his informant, talk about a country somewhere in the newly discovered Western Hemisphere the disclosure of its exact location having unfortunately been <coughs> obscured by a cough during their conversation. What's talked about initially is wasteful wars in Europe and capital punishment for theft, something which Raphael observes only encourages thieves to kill their victims in an attempt to eliminate potential witnesses without any additional consequence, since the punishment for murder and theft is the same. Following this observation, there is a discussion about the common causes for crime, largely stemming from economic disadvantage, lack of opportunity, and disparities within uh, society, which force 
the poor to commit crimes in a simple effort to survive. Continuing his discourse with Raphael, Moore learns about the crescent moon-shaped island of Utopia, apparently somewhere off the coast of Brazil, where challenges within human society have been addressed in a comprehensive and highly efficient manner. Under the original leadership of the society's founder, King Utops, the country was separated from the mainland through the creation of a 15-mile channel, about six miles narrower than the one dividing England from France, and then a careful system of cultural order was established. On the island, there are 54 municipalities with a capital city built directly at its center. The representatives from each of these cities elect a prince by secret ballot who then serves for life unless removed from office for acts of tyranny. There is no private property and people are given what they need and expected to work at least six hours a day for the good of the community. Criminals, those who refuse to labor for the collective good, are enslaved with chains made of gold alongside prisoners of war, although they can be released for good behavior. In an effort to create negative associations with materialism, gold is also used for such utilitarian things as chamber pots. Well, it doesn't rust. In addition, to buying goods from other nations or bribing them to fight one another when necessary as a somewhat Machiavellian way of reducing any potential threat to the utopian commonwealth, apparently based upon the relativistic notion that my enemy's enemy is my friend. Additionally, utopia has what might be called socialized medicine. Uh, with euthanasia being sanctioned by the state in cases of incurable illness, uh, death squads, I suppose that might be called, a divorce is permitted, but premarital sex is punishable through enforced celibacy for life, with adultery being punished by enslavement. Travel throughout the island is only allowed with an internal passport. Freedom of religion including atheism, is allowed. Although, people who don't believe in reward or punishment in an afterlife, uh, hedonistic epicureans, are strictly suspected in terms of being potential lawbreakers and therefore are encouraged to receive counseling, a kind of conversion therapy or at least re-education, I suppose that might be termed. Everyone wears the same type of plain homemade clothing. All meals are eaten in communal settings. There is no privacy. Women are required to confess their misdeeds to their husbands at least once a month. Alcohol consumption and gambling are prohibited. People are encouraged to seek out learning during their leisure time and the use of lethal force, even when providing military assistance to allied countries, is supposed to be avoided whenever possible. So, pretty clearly, in my mind at any rate, it would seem that Sir Thomas had some well-defined criticisms of his own contemporary English society and its need for various types of reform in mind when he undertook the writing of Utopia. To begin with, there was wasteful war with the French, about which Moore once is said to have commented to his son-in-law and biographer William Roper regarding Henry VIII. If my head could win him a castle in France, it would surely not fail to go which, of course, it did, even without the acquisition of a castle. And then there was 
enclosure. The large scale practice of fencing off commons areas to create deer parks for the wealthy, which reduced the available area for farming and displaced people who had previously lived within these regions that could sometimes be as large as several square miles in size. Henry had also been known to like dressing extremely extravagantly, wearing garments described as being all embroidered with roses made of rubies and diamonds. Then, in order to finance foreign wars, meet domestic expenditures, and provide for monarchical indulgences, the raising of taxes further impoverished large segments of the population contributing to increased levels of crime and, subsequently, the imposition of more and more severe laws and forms of mandatory sentencing as an attempted deterrent to the kinds of behaviors which had been prompted by the consequences of public policy in the first place. It was this spiral of social issues that Sir Thomas More initially appears to have wanted to address within his idealized fictional account of the nowhere land of Utopia. Then, falling back upon his reading of Plato's Republic, More devised the rest of the cultural conventions for his imagined society. By contrast to St. Sir Thomas's fictitious collective social welfare state disguised as a real place of undisclosed location, Machiavelli begins his political thesis by stating that there is a profound difference between the way people actually live and the way it has been imagined that they should live, further stating that to neglect the real in pursuit of the ideal is foolish. Rather, he contends in order to address real circumstances, it is necessary to adopt practical means as a way to accomplish intended ends. His argument, essentially, is that the ends justify the means no matter what they might be and in order to establish and maintain a well-functioning society, Machiavelli assumes that order is better than chaos and that in the name of order and subsequently the social good, a ruler must first and foremost ensure the perpetuation of his political power or his people won't have a country anymore. Consequently, he reasons that for a ruler to be successful, that is, to serve the good, in full agreement with Thomas More, order is more important than individual freedom. Further arguing that anyone who would act up a perfect standard of goodness in everything must be ruined among so many people who are not good, Machiavelli asserts that, in the name of social order and stability, it is essential for a political leader to have learned to be other than good as necessity requires. Observing that men will sooner forgive the death of their father than the loss of their property, Machiavelli argues, aside from avoiding contempt and hatred from the imposition of excessive taxes, a ruler should recognize some very basic precepts. It is better to be feared than loved. It is better, therefore, to be cruel than to be kind. In order to reduce the need for taxes, it is better to be selfish than generous. It is better to punish than to forgive. And it is better to break one's word when necessary than attempt to keep it. 
For the overall good of society, both Moore and Machiavelli appear to contend, as proclaimed by a 20th century Italian statesman named Benito Mussolini, all within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. As well intended as these individuals possibly had been, however, history appears to have shown that similar notions, as positive sounding on their surface as the utilitarian goal of the greatest good for the largest number, or the Marxist concept of from each according to his ability to each according to his need, have served to result in some fairly significant consequences which were very far removed from what might in any way be termed universal justice or the good. At the time of Machiavelli's and Moore's writing, of course, large-scale social experiments outside of a few fringe religious groups had not yet been attempted. As a result, their thinking lacked the benefit of such subsequent historic examples as the Bolshevik Revolution and its forced imposition of comradeship, or the Cultural Revolution in China, and then one-time high school teacher Paul Potts Khmer Rouge in Cambodia and its forced agrarian killing fields, or even the 20th century application of Machiavellian principles in Italy and later Nazi Germany with its unprecedented legacy of genocide. Obviously, neither Plato nor Thomas More, or even Niccolo Machiavelli for that matter, could have fully envisioned the extended application of their ideas. With regard to the issue of personal freedom, neither Utopia or the Prince appear to allow for a very large degree of that. For More, through his inoculator, Raphael Heathleday, the means to a desired social end is a kind of enlightened authoritarianism which acknowledges the necessity of breaking a few eggs in order to make a to each according to his need omelet. For Machiavelli, it's a less is more style of governance based upon the selective use of fear and a firm belief in the fundamental selfishness of human nature. The problem, I suppose, with good people on both sides, of this widely divergent spectrum is how to go about selecting the eggs to be broken. Is it eat the rich and power to the people, or love it or leave it and alt-right unite, or even some new form of woke social media hashtag that has yet to gain its necessary flash mob following. I'm Jeff Helgeson. Heirloom Books is located at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois, and is open from noon until 7 o'clock in the evening, Tuesday through Sunday. Next time, what I'm going to do my best to address is the literary work of an entire and truly significant century. The time between the death of England's Henry VIII in 1547 and the execution of that country's King Charles I in 1649.